I'm going to introduce you, as you probably know it very well. You probably have read it many times when you were in the hotel rooms and you didn't know what else to do. So you opened that drawer and found the Gideon Bible, right? You probably have six or seven at home now. It's a very handy thing. I had a friend back in Cincinnati who said she saved her virtue with the Gideon Bible. She was at a convention and was invited up to this person. It was a business convention. and was invited up to this person's room, you know, to talk. And they talked, and then he started getting handsy and whatever. She opened the drawer, she grabbed the Gideon Bible, and she started reading the Bible out loud as he chased her around the room. <laughs> she said he got so upset at her reading the Bible that he <laughs> changed his behavior pretty fast. A book of Job. Have you read it? Yeah, and uh, it can be pretty interesting. Job's an interesting character. Uh, well, he's, he's very wealthy. If you've read it, then you, you remember there was in the man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. Now, he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, remember, he was blameless and upright. I think he was one of the earliest codependents and caretakers. Because with all those children, ten children, he just knew that possibly they sinned and didn't offer offerings or whatever. So he went and he offered offerings for his kids, just in case. Wish my mother had done that for me. Maybe she did. A pretty interesting guy. We've all had the greatest of times in our lives, haven't we? Yeah. And then we come to a place where we think, well, somewhere there's got to be a book, some system that'll make seeking this this kind of spirituality easier. It make the journey shorter. And I won't have to do all this blind groping trying to figure it out for myself. What do you think? Think there's a book like that? Or you reach that place where you said you prayed and prayed and those prayers seemed to strike the vault of heaven made of brass and nothing could get through it. Yeah, <laughs> I had her too. Yeah, nothing can penetrate. Well, the book to have is the Bible. Oh, but wait a minute. There's, there's, that's an awful lot, don't you think? It's, and it's fine print and what is it, a thousand plus pages and and it's in kind of formal language and all those begots and there's too yeah it's obscure it's mysterious nobody can it can understand it isn't there something simpler that something that'll tell me what to do and how to do it well if that's what you think then you don't know your bible Fascinating book. The reality is there's nothing simpler than this book. Remember, it wasn't, it wasn't written for scholars. It wasn't even written for 20th century people and skeptics and people who will analyze it forward and backwards. Oh, no. It was written for every person in every time. There's nothing simpler. It shows every step that one can take along the way to spiritual growth.
It can be understood by the simplest, most literal-minded person, and it can sure confound the most intelligent and deep thinkers in the world. It's got something for everybody. And in it you find God's promises. Not only the promises, but promises that are clear without abstract philosophy and things that cloud the whole issue. Most important, I think, is that the Bible also teaches us how to pray. Uh, have you ever thought, well, if I could just buy a book of prayers, right? Doesn't quite work. Because some author's prayers are not my prayers. They're not my words. They don't come out of my heart. The Bible gives you some prayers that come out of the hearts of highly enlightened souls. Prayers that can be applied in many different ways. Prayers that can give you a pattern for how to pray how to make that connection. There are all kinds of prayers in the Bible. Perhaps you've read some of, some of Paul's Thanksgiving prayers. Perhaps <coughs> you really know the prayers Jesus used. The prayers of the prophets and of the poets who wrote the Psalms. Over the next two more weeks, a total of three Sundays, I'm going to look at three different what I think of as great prayers of the Bible. Not the only prayers of the Bible, but great prayers. The other two you already know, and probably you're very familiar with it. You just said one of them earlier, right? The Lord's Prayer. The, uh, that's a, that's a, a, a great prayer. But how about the prayer that occurs in the 22nd chapter of Job? probably never read it, or if you did, didn't pay much attention to it. Um, Job is the central character. It, his name is kind of interesting. Some say his name means he who turns to God. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Some also say, and the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary says, it means conflicted, persecuted. It can also mean one who kind of comes to him send himself, comes to his senses, which he does. When was it written and by whom? We don't know who wrote it. Uh, probably some scholars believe it was during the time of Solomon. But whatever it, whenever it came about and whoever wrote it, it's, it's a historic poem describing Events, events in a human being's life. They fit Job, they fit us. Wealthy man, you, you heard how much he had, you know, how many animals and, and servants and, and kids. And he, he, he was free from most worldly concerns. Didn't have to worry about where the next meal was coming from or where his next ride was going to come from, and all those, all the animals. And all of a sudden, uh, catastrophe strikes, and his life changes. Problems of human suffering confront him. After everything was going so well. Sound familiar? Whoa! I've been there a time or two. How about you? Yeah, things seem to be doing pretty well, and whew, all of a sudden something comes and throws you, and you don't know what to do. Maybe you do what Job did. Well, he had three friends, and he talked to his three friends, and those three friends all have solutions for him. I'm sure your friends have solutions for you, too. Yeah, somebody once said, well, you need to stay away from that place called unity. 
I think I'll stay away from that place called you. <laughs> People have various ideas. Well, his friends had various ideas. Those three friends in the book are symbols. They're, they're symbolic. They represent three phases of the intellect. So it's the intellect trying to make sense out of things. But as the book is written to answer the question, why human suffering? And why does God allow it? Well, we know why there's human suffering. We fall short, don't we? We get caught up in ego. We got caught up, we get caught up in negative thinking. And then we start to feel negative. And you know the the thing that is so true in your life, what you believe about yourself becomes your experience. What you believe about your life becomes your experience. So we can make we can make our lives a heaven or a hell. And I've done both in my time. I'm going to guess most of you have too. Experience the height and the depths. It's a great book. It's, it's like a soap opera. Uh, fascinating. And the entire narrative from beginning to end, it's about things that are going on inside of us. Now, the text is that I'm going to use is on the back of your bulletin. So you might just turn to that and look at that. First, I'm just going to read it and see if you hear things that are familiar. Agree with God and be at peace. I think James says, acquaint with God. Interesting idea. Not just agree with God. Come to a unity connection. Acquaint yourself with that power we call God and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty and humble yourself, if you remove unrighteousness far from your tents, if you lay gold in the dust, and gold of Ophir among the stones of the torrent bed, and if the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him, and he will hear you, and you will pay your vows. You will decide on a matter, and it will be established for you, and light will shine on your ways. For God abases the proud, but he saves the lowly. He delivers the innocent man. You will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. There's some powerful ideas in this. And I want to go through it verse by verse and talk about those powerful ideas. Overall, do you like it? Can you feel the power in these ideas. These, these words come from Eliphaz, one of Job's friends. And it, as I said, he's one of, the, one of the phases of the intellect, but he's starting to get it. He's starting to, to bring to Job's awareness that there's some things he needs to do in his life. He's got, been going through the motions. He's doing the burnt offerings, right? Well, if I just, you know, buy this, this animal and send it to the temple and have it offered, you know, I, that's all I need to do. I'll send him a check. That takes care of it, right? Uh, it's not about sending checks. It's not about anything but what, how you live your life and how you think about God, you, and your connection, your oneness, and your unity. Acquaint thyself with God, or agree with God, and be at peace. First, find that place of connection. 
Well, you're going to find it. You're only going to find it when you look inside. You can look outside all you want. There's a new, uh, new program appearing on HBO, and it's about the American Pope. It's fiction, okay? But the, the, I just saw that it's what could be the pilot episode. It's kind of interesting. The American Pope already is uh, arrogant, and uh, he's digging into all the secrets that everybody has in the background, and uh, they're not going to run him. But he, he has some, some interesting takes on life, and he sees what he can do to make a difference. You need to see what you can do to make a difference. One of the cardinals asked, you know, well, well, but where is God? And they were on the balcony looking out over the square, and, you know, where the Pope does audiences and things. And this, the American Pope pointed right up. There, in the Big Dipper, that's where God And right here, and sitting in this chair, and in your seat. Acquaint thyself with God, and you find that you have to look inside. You have to take time to still all of that noise, and all of that worry, and all the, the root brain chatter that gets in the way of hearing that still, small voice. What happens when you do this? When you take time to enter prayer, even to attempt to be still, to attempt to connect with the divinity within you, an attempt at meditation, it all works. It may take a little practice, because it is an art, but it works. And when you do, agree with God, connect with God, and be at peace. It brings a sense of peace, and thereby good will come to you because you're connecting to your source. Next line says, and this is number 22, receive instruction from his mouth. Does God have a mouth? God is mind. And what is, what is the product of, what is the instruction that comes from mind? Our ideas. Open yourself to God's ideas. Allow God to think its thoughts through you as guidance, direction. Lay up his words in your heart. Those words are going to be truth. And when you lay it up in your heart means it becomes part of your subconscious. It becomes part of you. And truth thinking becomes the habit as opposed to human thinking. If you return to the Almighty and humble yourself. Humble can also mean teachable to be open, to be teachable. There's nothing like somebody who knows it all. There's nothing you can teach them, right? Oh, I know, I know all of that. Teachableness, and with that openness, receptivity, if you remove unrighteousness far from your tents, if you begin to remove that negative thinking, isn't that unrighteous? Which then follows with negative emotions, can follow with negative actions. You have negative thinking, you're feeling negative emotion, you're getting angry with somebody, and then you want to do something, like get even. It doesn't have to progress. Begin to see the unrighteousness and let it go. Say, stop. It was, I, I love the, the story of the little girl who was so good 
and uh, one of the teachers said, honey, how come you're so, you, you're so well behaved? She said, well, I tell myself what to do. And then I make myself mind. Oh, we forget that part. We're pretty good at, well, you should do this and you should do that. Don't you tell yourself that? But if you never make yourself mind, none of it happens. If you lay gold in the dust and gold of Ophir among the stones of the torrent bed, you know, the, the, the flood stream uh, where things are washing away. <clears throat> this is not telling you that material stuff is bad, but when you make a god of it, when it's what you live for, you're not in this world to make a great living. You're in this world to live a great making. And <laughs> Jesus said, all the things follow when you realize, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is truth the understanding of the spiritual laws in back of your life and the universe. You hunger and thirst for that. And the other stuff follows. But it's never a burden when it follows with an understanding heart. It can be a real challenge when it's gotten by making it your whole purpose for living. So use it but don't become a slave to it. If the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. If you look to God first, if you see God as your source, if that's the power that you connect to and believe in, place your trust in, then it all follows. And you could hold your head up high because you'll realize you're God's child. No more do you need to think of yourself as miserable or not good enough, not as smart as your sister or your brother. Or Sally, who was the person you all know, couldn't stand all through high school because she got all the, the grades and all the acknowledgement and you didn't. You can stand tall with God. And you will decide on a matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. <coughs> You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you. And you will pay your vows. That's not about writing checks or offerings. Uh -uh. That's about speaking the word of affirmation and holding to it, following through, believing in it, holding to that vow. You've just said, God is my health. I can't be sick. Haven't you ever said that? Well, if you do everything then that says that's a lie, you're not keeping to your vow. You're letting it go. And you're letting what you want go. You will decide on a matter and it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. It's a great, great line. It means, well, in King James, it's instead of you will decide, thou shalt decree a thing. It's speaking the word. It's affirmation. It's what you make firm in your consciousness will become your experience. 
You will decide on a matter. You will decree a thing. You will affirm a thing. And it becomes your experience. And then it's as if the light of God is shining in your life, right? When it, the darkness is removed, the darkness of doubt, of fear, of want. When that light of God shines, your whole mind is filled with light. For God abases the proud. You see God running around smacking proud people down? It's been a while since I've seen that. I've seen more people smacking people down. <laughs> God, uh, they're writing as if God is a, a functioning like a human being here. But what happens? Law, spiritual law, the universe functions under law, right? What happens when you violate the law? Well, you could violate the law that, that, that is a part of electricity and decide you're going to wire a new, new outlet in your house yourself. You're not sure how to do it, but you're going to do it. And then your house burns down because of it. That's the equivalent. You violate, you violated a law, and what happens? Well, I've never done plumbing before, but I'm going to fix this because the plumber wants $300 just to show up at the door. So, I, shoot, I can go to a hardware store and get a part and put it on. Next thing you know, your kitchen's flooded and you're dealing with a new floor and warped cabinet. Is that God doing it? No. It's you misapplying something. Remember, we're not punished for sins, but by them. The sin is, is an error in, in the application of some principle. And all kinds of stuff comes from that, doesn't it? Mother used to say, there will be consequences. But he saves the lowly. When you know the law, when you are teachable, when you are humble enough to say, Father, show me, and are open to spiritual guidance, you're led through these challenges in life. But you have to remain open. He delivers the innocent man. Are you innocent? You were created innocent. You may not be in this moment, but you can be again. See, what happens when you, when you follow this, when you agree with God or acquaint yourself with God, you connect to God, when you change your thinking and you give up all the negativities, you become innocent again. And you are delivered. You are saved from yourself. You will be delivered, be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. That means your actions will be pure. Your actions will be in harmony with spiritual law. What's going to be the, the result of that? Good. And good alone. question comes, can you believe good alone is coming to you? Can you believe that you may make a decree for your life and it will stand? It will happen. Can you believe? Well, let's do it.